About 10 hours into my first city, I started watching City Planner plays and wanted to have more of a story-based natural evolution to my city. It made me start thinking a bit more about what I wanted to do rather than just creating more and more square or rectangular blocks. His Magnolia County playlist is an excellent example of how he uses a backstory and his previous job as a city planner to make organic looking and organic feeling cities. It's no secret that City Skylines 2 was launched in an extremely buggy state. Early game bugs kept me from being able to do exactly what I wanted while developing my first city, especially the garbage truck bug. But I decided this would be my learner city. I would use my lessons learned with the new simulation engine to make my future cities look and work better. Eventually, I used up almost all the land on the map with a relatively low population in the hundred thousands. But I was having trouble with folks complaining that the housing was too expensive. I found out that next time around, I need to purposely make some neighborhoods with mixed lots or smaller lots. Eventually, I decided I would wait for the first round of DLC before starting my next city, since it would come for new assets for beach properties. One of the things that I got slightly annoyed with with City Skylines 1 was getting a city built up and then needing to accommodate the new assets from the latest DLC. So I wanted to build a new city with the new assets as a focus. It was originally supposed to be out by the end of 2023, but the horrifically buggy game meant things got pushed back. I think they're currently targeting February or March for the beach assets to come out. I'm also excited to see what the Bridges and Ports expansion will give us next summer. Because of all the detailing you can now do with the vanilla game, for example, assigning specific turn lanes, I'm taking more of a notice of the way my hometown is designed. I also paid a lot of attention when I was in Brooklyn to see where the commercial is relative to the residential. I had this game on my wish list. I think because it's a roguelike game. But what got me over the hump to buy this game in 2023 was an Ars Technica review that described it as the base building aspects of games like Warcraft, Command and Conquer, and Age of Empires. That was always my favorite part of those type of games. I would try and build all my buildings and get them upgraded before trying to fight the enemy. So this seemed like the perfect game for me. Because this game is focused on the city building aspect, the economy is vastly more complex than the usual strategy game. The tutorial is vastly misleading about how tough things will get, because they provide you with the resources needed to complete the tutorial. The first time I was left to my own devices, it went disastrously and I lost. The best testament to how good this game is designed is that that loss didn't make me give up or put the game away for another day. Instead, what was originally intended to be a couple half hours of gameplay turned into two plus hour marathon games. And after those two play sessions, I still had many systems unexplored, like trade routes. Finally, the rogue aspects of the game, like the randomness that governs which buildings become available and which resources you have, make each playthrough a unique challenge. The roguelite aspects also mean that the game doesn't have to have a linear progression in order for the game to dole out these new features. Instead, the player buys the features with points and so expands the feature set without necessarily making it too much easier. I could be wrong, but I predict this will be a big addiction for me in 2024. I've spoken in previous years about how addictive Gwent has been. It's one of those games that when the bug bites me, I just can't get enough of it for days or weeks at a time. Eventually, I move on to something else and I'm okay until Gwent calls to me again. This year, it was June when my addiction hit. I started playing on my phone during a vacation and ended up playing a bunch on my laptop as well. It was interesting seeing how the gameplay began to change as CD Projekt Red announced they were done developing the game and that the community would end up governing new changes. The new track DLC continued to release throughout the year this year. Each time the new tracks would come out, we'd play as a family and experience all the tracks. The wife and I would also try to get perfect scores in each cup. 
I would try and master all the cups at all the different speeds as well as the mirror mode, but I don't know if I'm actually going to dedicate the time to it this year. Like Gwent, this game tends to get me addicted when I intend to play for just one play session. I find it a little more addictive than Slay the Spire, and I'm not sure if that's because I have a bunch of characters and multiple levels at once, or something else. But I could think of nothing else but finding excuses to play once I got re-addicted. This year, I focused on trying to unlock each hero character and modifier item. I made some very good progress on that. I didn't have very much luck getting to the final boss, especially when I tried to wage bets and enact difficulty modifiers in hopes of greater rewards. This year, I mostly played multiplayer games with my brothers, including losing in one of the games. My 19th solo game was as the Mongolians. I was too much of a generalist for too long and lost the game. There are basically two video games I play with my wife right now. One is Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. The other is Puyo Puyo Tetris. They're both games that use skills we've honed since we were young. They're both games that can be played in half an hour or less. And they're both games where I have to work hard not to lose to my wife. When I was growing up, the beat-em-up was a very vibrant video game genre with classics like Double Dragon, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Streets of Rage, and others. I don't tend to see new ones all that often, I remember seeing this game on the Xbox 360 when I went to visit Dan some 15 years ago. Sometime in the last couple years, I ended up with the game because of a humble bundle. I thought the game was silly enough that the kids would probably enjoy it, and boy was I right. They found the game incredibly hilarious, and we played together at every available chance until we had finally beaten the game. When the Pre-release hype train started for City Skylines 2. I was reading about the upcoming release and I got excited about playing this first game again. When I got back to my cities, I started to look at them with a new eye. I had given up on Danville because I ended up in a situation where I was broke without an ability to build a new power plant. Luckily, I got enough people to move in to get access to a loan. After that, I was able to revitalize the city and use everything I've learned about how to set up a city to make the best city I'd made so far. I popped back into Erinville to see what I could do with that city because I had started construction before most of my DLC and so had to stuff it in wherever it might fit. I also tried to work on Daveville, but it was flooded and I couldn't figure out how to fix the flooding. In a way, the mini addiction I had to surviving Mars was a preview of what would happen when I got against the storm near the end of 2023. What killed the game for me is that there was just too much micromanaging involved. I was constantly having to keep an eye on where the resources were piling up versus where they needed to be. Against the storm, at least as far as I've played, streamlines this a lot more and makes it a lot more enjoyable as a result. I might still return to this game and give it another shot. Who know? What more is there to say? This game, along with my other story-based games, was starting to suffer from me bouncing around different games. I couldn't remember what was happening. So I decided to just keep playing Disco Elysium until I reached the end of the game. Unfortunately, a few real-life things got in the way, and then I got addicted to City Skylines 2, followed by an Against the Storm addiction. But I plan to prioritize this game in early 2023. The story of the game started off pretty bonkers, but it turned out to be a story about capitalism versus communism and unions. Unlike most of the RPGs I've played, this one seems the most like a video game of D&D, but set in a futuristic world instead of fantasy. Based on where I left off with the plot in 2023, I'm very curious to find out how it ends up resolved. I decided that if I ever play this game on my own, I'm going to wait until it comes out of early access because the developers keep adding new features and gameplay changes. In 2023, 
I played with the kids to defeat some of the larger baddies and explore some new biomes. This was the biggest addiction for the kids until Scarlet discovered RimWorld, which seems to align even better with the type of game she likes to play. When I had surgery and got stuck at home, I started blazing through my video game rotation list, and I got back to Darkest Dungeons for the first time in a couple years. I got re-addicted to the challenges and the risk-taking involved in a permadeath game. This game continues to be quite a fresh challenge. I know I'm tempting fate by saying this, but I could see this game continuing to appear every year or every other year for a long time, or until I get the sequel. I continued to use my ill-advised purchase of a racing wheel to have a lot of fun with this game. I haven't quite got the hang of the drifting though. I haven't fully decided if I'm done with Dirt 3, but I've been considering playing one of the more traditional racers that doesn't focus on stunts and drifting, since those parts of this game tend to take me many, many tries to get right. The kids got the latest 2D Mario game as a gift this year. I was a little skeptical at first when I saw the trailer and the weird scenes where Mario's tripping. I guess Nintendo finally leaned into the whole Mario does mushrooms joke? But after playing a few levels, I realized this may be one of the most creative 2D Mario games since Yoshi's Island. I continued my role as the assassin everyone's afraid of, but probably shouldn't be. Although I'm doing better than I was when I first started the game, I still find myself exposing my identity a little too often and ending up in crazy gunfights. Since I'm going to focus on finishing Disco Elysium in 2024, and I'll have new City Skylines DLC to play with, I don't know if I'm going to get back to this game in 2024, but I do eventually want to finish it. The story is compelling enough. As I've said in previous years, since I beat the game with Dan a few times, I don't get the urge to play this game all that often, but occasionally, the kids will ask me to play. In 2023, we mostly played multiplayer arena matches. Sam is the only one who enjoys the regular levels. He asked me to play with him a few times, and we got surprisingly far. At least once we got as far as the Egyptian level before the enemies took us out. As I said earlier, partway through this year, I intended to commit myself to getting through this game, Disco Elysium, and Hitman. However, I'd bitten off more than I could chew with three narrative games. I kept forgetting the point of what I was doing by the time I got back to it. But then I got distracted with a few things and I never got back to these games. This might be a repeat of what I said for the past couple years, but I'd like to finally finish this game in 2024. I might put it ahead of finishing Hitman, but we'll have to see when the time comes to decide. Just like with Spelunky 2, Sam surprised me with how great he'd become with this game. When he asked me to play this year, we were able to make it all the way to the final boss twice. The second time, we were even able to defeat the final boss. I gave myself a challenge to try and get further than usual in the original Spelunky. And with Scarlet, I was indeed able to get further than I'd ever gone on the original Spelunky. I usually only play Team Fortress 2 on Halloween in order to play the chaotic Halloween maps. But this year, I actually ended up playing on a different day and was too busy on Halloween to play. It's still a very fun game. After playing Monster Train this year, I thought I would see if I could either beat this game with the last unlockable character or just see how far I could get with the others. I still enjoy Monster Train more, but I won't lie and say I didn't get re-addicted to this game a bit. Once again, I tried to get caught up with my wife, who beat the game in 2022, but I was unable to do so. Every year, I try and see if it will be the year I can win at least one run in FTL, and every year I meet disaster somewhere in space, sometimes ridiculously early on in the game. I still love the roleplay aspect of it, and I think it was brilliant of the developers to allow for naming the characters and the ships. They're just little pixel graphics, but I still feel a connection to them. I've said something like this for a few years now, but this year, the kids were taking a break from watching actual YouTubers and decided to watch my end of the year videos. 
This reminded them that they liked Rocket League. Another thing I've said before, which also held true this year, was that the kids continue to get better at this game the older they get. I don't know what it is about Smash for the Switch, but I just find the controls to be much harder than the GameCube or Wii version. I did a passable job against the computer or my family on these older versions, but in this version, I just feel like my character isn't responding the way I want it to. Before the kids became obsessed with other games, they started a new multiplayer farm on Stardew Valley. They asked me to join them, and so I did. But after that one play session, they never really played Stardew Valley again in 2023, so they never invited me back to the farm. And now it's time to consider Game of the Year. Just like last year, Disco Elysium was a contender for Game of the Year this year. Getting deeper into it has revealed all the different systems that work in the game. It's really complex. And it made me laugh more than almost anything else this year, whether books, movies, TV shows, or games. It's also become clear that there's more to the main character than just a silly joke. But I didn't finish it, so we'll save it for another year. As my most played game this year, City Skylines 2 is also a great contender. I had a ton of fun playing the game. I'm not faulting the game for the bugs it launched with, but those bugs did stand in my way sometimes, um, especially the uh, garbage bug. And it kept the first DLC from coming out. I really wanted to start my second city with the uh, Beach Properties DLC already, so I don't have to uh, find a way to fit that into my city. And also, the mod support isn't there, and that's a big part of what makes City Skylines, the franchise, um, so good. As I record this video in January of 2024, I've only loaded up the game once. It didn't rekindle my addiction. Speaking of addiction, I think the best contender for the 2023 game of the year is Against the Storm. For me, it's on the same level of addiction as Gwent or Monster Train. I got it at the end of the year in December, and it still ended up being my second most played game. When I started playing it, I gave up almost every other hobby. I just wanted to keep going until I um, sealed that until I caused that first seal to close up. As the year ended, I was just starting to understand how to do well, and I still have a long way to go. So, which one am I going to choose? Well. It was a really tough choice between City Skylines 2 and Against the Storm, but I couldn't ignore how Against the Storm just came into my life and just became the only thing I cared about. Against the Storm is my Game of the Year for 2023.